Hello, welcome to a discussion on development, under development and dependency. When we talk about development, we talk about the process of progression of the society in terms of its capacity to generate wealth and employment for the larger development of the society, larger well-being of the society. When you talk about underdevelopment, conventionally we talk about lack of those capacities of generation of wealth and employment in mm -hmm. the society. And when you talk about dependency, we talk about a phenomenon which squeezes the spaces for exercising the autonomy, economic autonomy, political autonomy and social autonomy. In today's discussion, we shall be focusing on development, underdevelopment and interdependency, their interrelationship. As we talk about development, we also talk about implication of development, implication of the development for the larger part of the society, larger part of the nation and of the people. So it is also having the impact for the developmental process itself because it generates wealth and employment because conventionally development has been perceived and conceptualized in terms of gross domestic product that is the capacity to generate wealth and employment for this society. When these capacities are not sufficiently fulfilled, it is not acquired, then we go to the phase of what we call it underdevelopment. In today's discussion, we shall be talking about the trajectory of economic development, both of the developed and underdeveloped nation. We shall be talking of intersectionalities between the market, industrialization, modernization, development and underdevelopment. We will be talking about the process of colonization and then the emergence of the three world, the first world, second world and the third world. Then the critiquing of this development theory, developmental perspective from a category of the uh, social scientist whom we call the dependency theorist, uh, especially the formulation of Rawl Parvesh, then we will talk about the Ande Goulal Frank, uh, then we keep on talking about their basic formulation in terms of uh, center periphery theory, the, the world capital uh, theory and also new colonization theory. And at the end we will be trying to develop a critique of this theoretical perspective. Let us first talk about the trajectory of economic development um, in, in the society. When we talk about development, we usually talk about a process as we told earlier in terms of the capacity to produce wealth and employment and those are quantifiable, quantifiable in eco economic terms. But the developmental process as initiated in the modern world, it has started from the whole process of commoditization of production, the process of commoditization that segregated the family from the marketplace. The market emerged an autonomous site of production of the goods and services um, than that of the family. Earlier it was the family, the household that was the sole unit of production, distribution and consumption uh, in the society. So when the market emerged, a kind of a dissociation between this family and the market took place. In the whole process, it has been thought about that at the market expanded, at the production expanded, it looked for more and more market because it needs more and more the market for the selling of those commodities, simultaneously more space to acquire all those kind of a raw materials which are required for the productions of the goods and services in the society. And altogether this expansion of the market gradually leaked to the industrial growth and more profit and accumulation of the profit simultaneously contributed to the more investment in the industrial sector and gradually more earning of the profit and more generation of the wealth and employment for the country. What it was thought of at this point of time, the economic growth was thought of and till now thought of in terms of economic determinism. That is a kind of economic output and economic growth that will lead to the prosperity of the society. This economic growth widely enhanced not only with the increased productivity, the productivity that was facilitated by the forces of modernization, 
forces of industrialization and it was thought of that modernization and industrialization it will it will be panacea it will be panacea of all kind of social ailments so what happened in the whole process of this economic determinism economic determinism that was facilitated by modernization and industrialization it also led to a process of colonization uh, colonialism um, uh, colonialism in that way when the local market was insufficient to to generate that demand and simultaneously to suffice the supply factor it look for more and more countries more and more market in the process the weak nations of the world become the victims of colonization become the victims of the modernizing forces and the industrialized countries and gradually in the whole process they are become an inequality and exclusion inequality means the world become divided in terms of growth world become divided in terms of uh, sense of inclusion countries had the oil become concentrated uh, they become the rich nation and those the wealth become less concentrated they, they are unable to produce that quantum of the wealth they are conventionally defined at the poor nations so what happened in the whole trajectory of the development we find the first world the capitalist world capitalist world that was widely guided by and is widely guided by the whole factors of development that is industrialization modernization and private production of the goods and services then we find the second world the socialist world that also look for the growth growth in terms of state sponsored planning a centralized planning and a distributing mechanism of that production then we are having the third world the least developed countries they are having uh, less education less wealth and uh, they are they are having less military power and they are dominated economically and politically mostly by the first world so they, they, this is the story of the third world but third world economy at times been mix of the uh, socialistic pattern mix of the capitalist pattern so here you find a different kind of economic formulation so whatsoever we have seen in terms of three worlds of development first world the capitalist world second world the socialist world third world that is the mixed economic pattern but all this three economic pattern three economic pattern three world looked into development in terms of the capacity to generate more and more gross domestic product in terms of producing more and more goods and services of this society so everybody followed that path all this country started following that path but this developmental perspective at it was thought of as a panacea for all social ill panacea for the eradication of poverty ill health illiteracy crime immorality in the society so that perspective was critiqued because this development was thought of in terms of creating more and more world inequality uh, world inequality inequality among the nation and also inequality within the nation in terms of separate segment of the population here emerges a category of the theorist they call it dependency theorist a new kind of a perspective they started throwing on let us talk about what is the major credential uh, of those theories how, how it emerges and what kind of uh, new theoretical perspective the critiquing the first world and the second world perspective uh, how they critique um, uh, uh, that is quite important so one of the famous social scientists that is rol parves rol parves widely talked about a kind of a inequality between the developed nation and the underdeveloped nation rol uh, parves was basically he is he is from argentina and he started uh, critiquing the western approach of development the western approach of development ruthlessly was going for gross domestic product and in the process it it proliferated a new kind of capital a new kind of social oil wing uh, of, of, of the western society uh, rawl parvesh what he thought about he, uh, he rather examined examined the perspective of the oil creation oil generation uh, of the latin american country is basically from latin america so what he talked up thought of and he found that uh, the oil being of the developed nation is dependent on poverty and underdevelopment of the 
four countries, four countries of the global south. So he, he was talking about a kind of a wealth inequality, that wealth inequality had emerged mostly because of unequal capacity to generate wealth and employment between this country. Here he took the help of political economy. Political economy in that way, that it is an economy not autonomous of the political space and the political power. Rather, it, it, it is a kind of a uh, equation between the economic and politics that was giving birth to different kind of economic formulation and economic growth. It was a politically driven economic phenomena within that and unequal economic growth, unequal development has taken place across um, the globe. Uh, he, he was quite influenced by Keynesian economic theory that is um, the state should be involved, state should be involved in the generation of wealth and employment, it, it should not be totally left to the market. So state is uh, having some role to play, an important role to play for the generation of wealth and employment. So what he was finding that gradually the role of the state was squeezed. Uh, there emerged more and more role of the market. Market was determining that creation of the wealth and employment. In the pro process of bridleless, uncontrolled growth of the market driven economic development, um, that, that inequality became a worldwide phenomenon. So, Raul Parvesh, he, because he is basically from Argentina, as I told, that is, he was looking at the economy, rural economy, very closely. Rural economy of the third world countries is widely dependent on agriculture um, because it was agriculture centric economy and he was observing that why, why despite making um, hard work, despite making enormous investment in agriculture, why the third world cultivator, especially of Argentinus cultivators was unable to get the equal return like that of the farmers and producers of America. What he concluded looking at the whole phenomenon of Argentina being the president of Argentina's central bank, he observed that there is an unequal process of interaction between the raw material rather the food producing uh, industries and the manufacturing uh, manufactured centered um, uh, countries. The food producing countries, those who are producing the food, they are unable to cope with the market penetration of the developed countries. So what he saw that the farmers producing wheat and meat were, um, uh, and getting manufactured good, goods from the uh, US. So farmers were producing their material of wheat and meat by themselves, but they are getting the um, manufactured good from the uh, uh, US. Uh, what he found that is, um, uh, as a president of Central Bank, he observed that during the Great Depression, prices of the primary product, that is the product from the agriculture that fall, while the prices of the manufactured good that increased. So what happened when well, there is economic depression, the producer, the indigenous producer, producers of the agricultural commodities, they become the victims, where the profiteers become the manufacturing good um, uh, producers. He also looked into another uh, phenomenon that is, um, uh, that is that market driven economy was unable to explain beyond the local supply demand dynamics because earlier economy they were not interconnecting uh, the interrelationship between the local and the international uh, demand supply phenomenon. He looked into that one in a critical way and he observed that farmers kept on making same investment but they are getting lower return. When there is economic depression, the farmers were get, making similar kind of investment but the returns were coming the less. Where those who are producing the manufacturing goods, those who are coming from uh, abroad, they are making the same kind of investment but they are getting the higher kind of return. What you observe that the world was economically linked because American economy was linked to the Argentinian economy in that way because that economy was getting the wheat and meat from Argentina but 
America was supplying the manufactured goods of all sorts to Argentina's economy. A kind of a dependency relationship was there between America and Argentina. But what he observed, this relationship was not that of an equal term. It was a kind of a relationship of central and peripheral relationship. Center, those were the core of the economy, that is manufacturing, uh, the industries, they are having those industries, they were producing the manufactured good, while the, those were peri uh, peripheral country, they were mostly uh, uh, producing the agricultural good. The, uh, so, a relationship, unequal relationship gradually emerged between the center, that is the uh, developed countries and, and the peripheral countries emerged to be the um, uh, third world countries those who are widely producing the agricultural goods. So, in the process of that, what you found a kind of a de relationship of dependency. It is not of interdependency, it is dependency. Dependency means the Argentine economy become dependent on the American economy because it was the, during the depression, economic depression, uh, America was, American for America's manufacturers were getting more and more returns, whereas the producers of Argentina were getting less and less returns. So, in the process, the kind of a dependency relationship grew uh, between uh, these two developed and the developing countries. So, in the center periphery uh, theories, he, he, he gave certain, he observed certain uh, phenomena because it is an worldwide phenomena. Because the developing countries are not only the country of Latin America, developing countries also countries of Africa, countries of Asia, those who countries, those who belong to the global south, those the countries of global north, they are having a different economic phenomenon, they have emerged to be economically and politically powerful. So, what you observe, these countries, that is the countries those who are the center that is countries american countries west european countries those who are the global north those countries are at the center where the other developing countries are at the periphery what you observe these countries are located economically and politically in unequal space that is uh, they are in uh, both in economic terms and in political terms or also unequal space in terms of geographic terms. But within that, he also observed that within that country there is also a kind of inequality that I am coming little later. Uh, second, he observed that the countries of the center and periphery, these countries are interconnected through unequal imports and exports because there should be a balance of trade. What he was locating, there is no balance of trade. People are importing more, that is the developing countries, the poor countries, they are importing more and exporting less. Ultimately, what was happening in the whole process, there emerged an unequal trade, terms of the trade. So, these countries are not equally placed. So, those were the poor countries, they become dependent on the developed countries, dependent in terms of new technology, the manufactured goods and so many other kind of uh, uh, capital, organization of capital and technology, those who are required for the production. Then he again talked about the center occupied by the manufacturing developed risk countries and periphery are the raw material agricultural product as the primary product and the primary producing countries. As I told in earlier section, that is these two countries are, are divided in terms of um, the countries involved in manufacturing goods and services and other countries are the suppliers supplying the raw materials and the agricultural product. The another important component, the primary good producing countries dependent on the core, it become dependent on the core countries for manufacturing goods, imports of manufacturing goods. So, what is happening? Those who are the uh, primary producing countries, the agriculturally dependent countries, uh, agriculturally uh, the countries producing the agricultural goods, they become dependent on the developed countries to get the manufactured goods. Uh, so, in the process, the unequal terms of trade also emerge. Then he talked about the center retained the higher profit, saving and the wages through developed union and commercial institution. 
So the, uh, by producing, they're earning more profit and uh, they're having more saving and also liberal of that countries are getting more wages because more of the liberals are unionized and also having uh, commercial institution. But what's happening in the developing countries? In the periphery, the companies and the workers are weak. To have pass on technical saving, to the consumers by way of reducing prices because here price can be reduced if the if the price price can be reduced then the laborer will be suffering so what is happening there is unequal competition uh, rather there is absence of competition there is an amount of dependency on, on them dependency between this manufacturing countries and the raw material supplying countries so what he talked about that is declining terms of trade as the peripheral countries are importing more because more you import and less you uh, export uh, 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 there is an unequal uh, trade of terms now ultimately what happened in the whole process benefits of international trade and as advanced technology accrue to the advanced countries so what is happening that is in the process of that unequal terms of trade unequal uh, power of exchange uh, the gradually the third world countries becoming dependent on the uh, developed countries. So what are the altering mechanism because this, this, this mechanism can't sustain for long. So what are the alternative? He talked about to stop importing manufactured goods from the core countries. That is the first. Second, import substitute to save the foreign exchange because when you are selling the goods to the outside countries, you are having certain foreign exchange. But what you do, you use that foreign exchange to purchase more and more manufactured goods. So you are always foreign exchange deficit. What he told that you will have to have certain import sub substitute. The thing which you import from the other countries, you will have to have certain indigenous industries, indigenous products. So you can you can substitute those kind of product. Then he talking about poor countries could sell primary goods and their foreign exchange reserve should not be used for the purchase of secondary goods from the market. As I told earlier, that whatsoever the, this is the saving uh, in foreign exchange that can be used for the purchase of the secondary good, that also uh, from the developed countries. Then he told the domestic market has to be developed to meet the demand for the manufacturing goods. So domestic market is widely warranted because uh, until unless there is domestic market for the domestic product and the manufactured good, you will not be having uh, that is the supply demand uh, combination. So there should be a domestic market for the manufacturing good and also those goods produced indigenously. That was the kind of a solution he was suggesting. Uh, let us come uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, the uh, writings of uh, Ande Gulal Frank. Uh, uh, well, Parvesh was writing, his thesis was, as I told, look at in the political economy, uh, Ande Gunal Franks and other uh, uh, writers like uh, Harku Karsodo and Theodore Nodos, Santos uh, and many others, they, they highlighted uh, a kind of a, a social condition, the class structure and regional imbalances and the inner colonization those are the factors also contributing to the dependency relationship. So it is not a kind of a relationship between the developing and the developed nation. There is also class character, class inequality within the developing country, regional imbalances within the regional countries, and there is a process of inner colonization, colonizing the country by the internal people um, for the production and dissemination of the goods and services. So those kind of critiquing came from the writings of the scholars. So we'll specifically focus on Andre Gulal Frank. Uh, he, though he is a German by birth uh, and he got education in US um, in 15 and 60s, then he went to Latin America to observe the process of economic development and the interlinkages between the developed and the developing countries and the inner dynamics of development uh, within those countries. Uh, Andre Gunal Frank was a Marxist and uh, he, he looked into the gap uh, in, in the class term, class between the poor and the rich um, and also uh, economic power relationship uh, in a capitalist setup. So what he was looking into a kind of 
growth of capitalism, the global growth of capitalism across the uh, uh, countries and also within the countries. And then he talked about that how that inequality class character and the class structure has impeded uh, the economic relationship, economic development of those countries. So what he talked about, he was uh, first that he was uh, very critical to economic liberalism, that is privatization. Uh, to be the sole uh, cause of economic uh, underdevelopment. It was uh, uh, many, many, many uh, uh, you know, scholar that time, uh, especially the uh, American scholar, they uh, they accepted the fact, rather they they pointed out the fact that one of the major cause of underdevelopment of the underdeveloped countries, uh, especially developing countries, because there was lack of economic liberalization, there was lack of privatization. So they talked about there should have been more and more privatization paving the way for economic development in those countries. Uh, Andre Gulal Frank was against this view. He was critical to economic liberalism, that is economic liberalism, um, uh, uh, the way it was talked about privatization, he was against that. What he rejected, he rejected the idea that underdevelopment is represented by feudalism and lack of exposure to modernization. It was widely talked about the countries of the global south are mostly feudal in character. They inherited a lot of traditional legacies and there is no exposure to modernization. Modernization means uh, in terms of those technology, in, uh, introduction of those technological innovation, both in agriculture and industry and in service sector, that will contribute to economic development. So he, he, he was against that view. That is, it was the presence of capitalism and less project to, uh, exposure to modernization. That was the cause of underdevelopment of the underdeveloping countries. Uh, he accepted that underdevelopment is because of expansion of the global capitalism. Capitalism that was spreading across the globe, uh, that is because of the free trade, because of economic liberalism that transformed the feudal system and used their surplus for the benefit of the developed world. What is talking about when there is a capitalist development across the globe, the benefits of this development has not been equally distributed. Not all countries have got the equal benefits of this growth of world capitalism. And because of this unequal growth of world capitalism and expansion of capitalism, you have destroyed many of the indigenous institution and whatsoever surplus are produced out of the expansion of capitalism, uh, it was only accrued and taken care of or taken advantage of this benefit by the developed nation. Uh, then he goes on arguing that the world capitalism, uh, that underdevelopment is not the original condition, rather it is created by the world capitalism and use their surplus for the benefit of developed nation. So it, it was not that uh, underdevelopment was an inherited phenomenon uh, of all the underdeveloping countries or the third world countries. What he told that underdevelopment is a product, is a product of expansion of capitalism across the globe because the benefits of that capitalism has been accrued, has been um, exploited, manipulated by the developed nation. Then again he talked about underdevelopment is um, uh, is large part of historical product of past and continuing economic relationship between the satellite, satellite underdeveloped and the developed metropolis uh, of the countries. He divided the countries in two parts of the globe because when the world capital is growing and world capitalism has created unequal world. In this unequal world, he found two kind, time, kinds of countries. One countries are the satellite underdeveloped countries. What are the satellite countries? They keep on revolving against powerful ones. And what are those powerful ones? They are the developed metropolitan countries. They are the economically wealthy countries. They have that kind of economic magnetic power that kind of a political power that can control, make the other satellite countries to revolve against them uh, uh, through their influence, uh, through their economic growth and economic development. So what is finding a kind of an unequal relationship? In this unequal relationship, some developed countries have emerged to be the metropolitan countries that the powerful uh, 
um, uh, countries in terms of industrialization, economic development, educational development, where the other countries are supposed to be the satellite countries uh, deprived of all those developmental indices uh, if, uh, in those countries. Then it goes further. That is underdevelopment occurred historically. It is not that uh, it was inherited, rather it has developed historically through the practice of slavery and colonialism and continues today through Western dominance of the international trading system. So that underdevelopment, it, it's continuing. It, it is not that those countries uh, of global south, uh, they were inherently underdevelopment, rather the victims of development. Because in the historical process of the slavery and the colonization, the resources of this underdeveloped world were exploited by this developing one and there has been that unequal system between these countries. And through this practice, the industrial nation made a surplus accumulation of capital which was invested in Britain's industrial revolution. So quite interesting what he was talking about. That is the historical development, expansion of colonialism, expansion of uh, you know, uh, capitalism and also uh, the trade, the slavery etc. like this. What happened in the process? The indigenous system of industries, those who are there, um, uh, those who are uh, diminished and gradually a new industrial system came in and they came in to extract the surplus and they used that surplus and reinvested it for the further expansion of the trades and services in their countries. So mm -hmm. what happened? The world capitalist system emerged. The underdevelopment, what he is suggesting, underdevelopment is a part of world capitalist <coughs> system with the international division of labor where the underdevelopment state provide the cheap primary goods as cheap raw material, agricultural commodities, cheap labor, services as repositories of surplus capital, obsolete technologies and market for manufactured goods. So what is happening this in this world capitalist system, those who are the third world countries, the underdeveloped countries, they have emerged to be the biggest provider of cheap primary goods, cheap raw material and the agricultural commodities, simultaneously provider of the cheap labors and serving as, as a pool of surplus capital and obsolete technologies um, and the market of manufactured good. Because since those technologies can produce those required number of the goods and services, it is dependent on the manufactured good that is coming from the developed nation. So we are finding an underdeveloped world characterized by economic uh, you know, negligence and the capitalist world. It is, it is a developed one, it is a developed one having the all capacity to produce industrial goods and services. Then he is talking about that, that uh, those who are the industrial nation, they have taken the uh, a comparative advantage. The money, goods and service do flow to the uh, de developed states, but their allocation are determined by dominant state and take the comparative uh, advantage. So there is a flow of money, he is not denying that, there is a flow of goods, money and services uh, to the developing nation. But they are dependent on the capitalist world, as they are dependent, the capitalist world is taking a strategic a comparative advantage of the situation. Then what is happening? The exploitation of the third world colonies. Um, he goes further taking uh, another uh, social scientist, uh, Paul Harrison, what he is talking about. In the 18th century, Europe was able to use the advanced technology um, uh, to conquer and colonize many parts of the third world. Exploited the colonies for cheap food, raw material, the labor, uh, uh, even turn those countries, many of these um, uh, local countries, those who are subsistence crop, crop producers, turn to the cash crop producers for the exports. So what they happened, they exploited the resources of the third world uh, in the process because they, they had this technological supremacy and the political suprem military supremacy use that military and technological power and the political power to conquer and the colonize the developed world and use their cheap labor and their raw material and the labor for the benefits of their own country. 
Now, what um, uh, Ante Gural Frank is talking about, this system can't uh, long last. So, what is the alternative? He is suggesting that there is a need of a socialist revolution. Uh, that is, to Frank, the developed countries can never develop so long as they remain part of the world capitalist system because the capitalism has spread across the country, both in the first world, in the second world, even in the third world. So, um, uh, uh, these countries can, can, can develop remaining dependent on the first world. What is suggested? A socialist revolution may be necessary uh, in the least developed countries to overcome the ruling classes who collaborate with the West. What is talking about within the developing countries, there is a ruling class. They also function to suffice the cause of the developing developed nation. So they are to be overthrown uh, through a socialistic revolution. So this is a kind of alternative framework he, he was suggesting uh, in his writing. Uh, then we find another important writer, uh, uh, Heter. Uh, that is Theodore Hater. He talked about um, new colonization. Uh, when uh, we talk about colonization, now we are talking about the new colonization, colonization uh, from within. Because Anthony Gideon was also talking about colonization. Colonization, uh, a, a kind of using the uh, indigenous elite, they are supervising the purpose of the. Uh, economic and political need of the developed nation. So what he was arguing, uh, that's a hater, he is arguing uh, that new colonialism in the least developed countries, uh, this is widely initiated by the multinational companies taking advantage of the cheap labor, uh, relaxed uh, health and safety laws and the low taxes. Many times the multinational corporation, the multinational industries, they are coming to the developing countries. They are using the pool of the cheap labor and the, there is a uh, relaxed health and the safety laws and the low tax laws. They are taking advantage of it and they are manipulating the situation uh, for the economic well-being not of the developing nation but of the developed nation. The less developed countries are pressurized to accept the um, terms and condition of investment uh, by the multinational companies to make the internal policy change and to support the Western strategic interest. It is quite important that multinational corporation, um, they can function um, in the countries without liberalizing the indigenous rules and regulation. So what they try to do, they pressurize the local elite, the indigenous elite, elite and the ruling class of the uh, low, uh, less developed countries uh, to change the rules and regulation, um, uh, to liberalize the terms of investment and make the uh, several internal political and institutional changes so that penetration and incoming of the western industry become easier in those countries. So in the process what he is talking about a kind of legacy the trade the world trade the legacy of colonial colonialization uh, which continued uh, till the uh, till 1940s also continues um, in the contemporary world because the local elite suffice the purpose of multinational corporation. Uh, then he talks about the uh, their economic um, uh, economy still uh, based on the export of cash crop and raw material to the West. Because since the developing countries, they have not been able to develop the indigenous industries and this capability that dependent on the export of uh, cash crop, what they were producing, the wheat, the cotton, the sugar uh, countries uh, and the raw material to the West. Uh, because they can process them uh, due to lack of uh, those capacities, so uh, they export to the West, but the, what they get back from the West, uh, they get a, a, ex, uh, from the West the manufactured good. So what we find a kind of interdependency between the uh, uh, developed and the developing nation in terms of economy, in terms of technology, in terms of market uh, and also a kind of a uh, political uh, ideology of colonialism. Uh, and and new colonialism. Uh, at this point, let us go a little further. Another two scholar, that is 
uh, Simpson and Sinclair widely talked about uh, the now in the contemporary world the multinational corporation they dominate the capitalist world and even interfere with the internal political mechanism of the uh, of the of the uh, uh, least developed countries. Illich also argues in the same way uh, because he argues that multinational corporations are guilty of creating a false need uh, in the market product. Uh, for their market product in the least developing countries because if some products are produced the products are to be sold you can't sell those products in the market until unless you create a sense of need many of the time those are not the basic necessities those are luxury needs so you, you create a, a high sense of power hypertension in the society by creating a false need. Go and have it. Without having it, maybe your status will not be enhanced in the society. A kind of a false need is created in the society in all forum, in the consumer goods. That may be car, that may be a home decor, that may be um, a new brand of uh, electronics. So the, th those are created in the society um, to penetrate uh, the market forces of the global West. Uh, the official aid is another uh, thing that is it is the official aid when the developed countries give the official aid uh, to the developing nation usually they put the condition um, uh, for import liberalization uh, uh, a kind of a liberalizing trade condition. So this is many a time uh, this, this may go or against the economic interest of the developing countries. Uh, what he is talking about the uh, flow from one country to another, most usually in the form of loan. Uh, many times that loans are come in the form of weapon, in the form of medicine, in terms of human expertise. So whatsoever the loan, even the multinational corporation or the uh, other can't developed countries provide to the developing one, uh, they don't come in a full form, they come in a package form in the form of getting the military weapon, uh, at times certain medicine which may have been discarded in those countries and also human expertise into giving certain consultancy for those countries. So a, 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 what we find a kind of a unequal relationship between the developed and the developing nation in terms of economic de uh, uh, development of these countries. Now let us have a, a kind of a at this stage um, uh, a, a, a evaluation of this theory. Um, that is, uh, what are the, uh, how we can evaluate this uh, relevance of this theory in the contemporary world. It is important that the uh, dependency theory has widely talked about the unequal relationship between uh, the developed and the developing nation that is also quite explicit even to this world. Um, the global uh, uh, north till dominate the politics economy of the global south in, in varieties of way in terms of industrial technology, in terms of uh, being the authors of information and communication technologies, the military technologies, the consultancy, the advisors, etc. like this, a, a kind of an unequal relationship emerges. So uh, that is quite explicit uh, well narrated. Uh, it also widely talked about the limitation of colonialism, imperialism and capitalism to ensure um, the uh, quality of equality between the uh, global north and the south. It was widely thought of that is when there is a kind of economic growth, a faster rate of economic growth, inequality between the developed and the developing nation will be minimized, uh, will be eradicated. Even within the country it will be eradicated. Unfortunately, that eradication has not taken place in the society. Uh, uh, so, so what we find that that limitation is widely pointed out. Uh, however, the important part is that uh, this theory, uh, this perspective is not supported by the empirical fact. Uh, though there are certain examples that ex examples are not um, uh, very extensive. So what is warranted that dependency theorists will be using more and more empirical research to, uh, to give certain um, uh, to, to prove the validity of the uh, uh, proposition which they have supported. Uh, uh, another important limitation is that it is quite abstract and uh, it homogenizes the country in terms of two that is global north and global south developed and the developing. So it's a kind of a homogenizing but within that country there are a lot of variation taken into consideration in the sub countries wide variation economic, political, cultural. Um, uh, role of 
uh, this theory also widely ignored because we have to accept this fact that industrialization and multinational corporation uh, is having a role to play in economic development of the developing world. That part is quietly uh, ignored. Uh, it does not reflect on the changed socio-economic and the political scenario of the contemporary world. If somebody is to look into the importance of the contemporary economic scenario that is, uh, that is uh, not reflected in that theory. However, we have to accept certain positive part of this theory that is dependency theory is useful uh, in the limited sense that it offers an international political economy framework for understanding uh, underdevelopment. So uh, that, is, that is quietly well taken and it rightly emphasizes the interdependence of economic and political relationship in the international arena because no economy is independent of the political phenomena, no politics is independent of the economy. So that interrelationship is um, quite important. And last important part is that uh, uh, the uh, world economic uh, theory, what uh, uh, Ande Gunal Frank was talking about the colonization and satellite uh, it periphery theory was talked about other thinker uh, that help us to understand the phenomena of, of uh, neoliberal globalization in which the contemporary world is situated today. So this is the all we are talking about uh, the uh, dependency theory and its linkages with interdependence. So at this stage uh, let us have a um, uh, summing up that is what we have tried to speak in this um, uh, theory. Uh, in this uh, discussion, first we have talked about uh, the whole course of economic development, the unequal space of economic development in the society. Uh, later on we talked about various facets of interdependency theory in terms of um, the uh, 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 capitalism that is global capitalism, emergence of global capitalism, central periphery theory, colonialization and the neo-colonization. Neo Later on we talked about the limitations and advantages of this theory in understanding uh, the whole facets of development in the society. What is warranted that we will have to develop a critic of the developmental perspective because all this developmental perspective so far talked about growth in terms of economic development. They have not taken care of the growth in terms of happiness, growth in terms of uh, the fulfillment of personality, that growth and economic development in terms of what we call freedom. So what is warranted that uh, a total criticism of those theory, theoretical perspective should come in terms of empiricism, in terms of lot of data coming from the below. Thank you very much for being with this lecture.